Do you remember this guy named Uza or Uzza? Sometimes I get corrected with both. <laughs> when I've preached this sermon and I, and I, I talk about Uza, I'll say Uza, and somebody from the crowd will say Uzza. And sometimes I'll say Uzza, and somebody from the crowd will say, it's Uzza. <laughs> so you're both wrong, probably. <laughs> I don't know. It's got to be something like that. But so, you know, David's cousin, that guy, Uze, he found a new one. <laughs> so uh, Uza, Uza, um, Uze, he was, he was responsible for transporting the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, you remember how they lost the Ark of the Covenant? They were getting their butts kicked in battle. And so what do they do? They decide, you know what is a surefire way to get victory? Let's grab that Ark of the Covenant, boy. The presence of God comes in. We are guaranteed victory. Suddenly, they start using something that is holy for their own personal advantage. Um, John Wimber uh, used to say, John Wimber was a pastor. Uh, uh, he, you know, was the founding father or a founding father of the Vineyard Movement. Um, he said, it is illegal to use worship for anything other than worship. It is illegal to use worship for anything other than worship. What is that? What do you mean by that? you're in a healing meeting and you want to see some miracles. So you want the presence of God to come. Everybody, let's just worship the Lord. And suddenly we've begun to use something that was designed only for him and we begin to use it for us. And suddenly we've grabbed that Ark of the Covenant and we've just hauled it off into battle. Well, if we learned anything from the Israelites, that's a good way to lose the glory. Hmm. So that's what happened, right? You guys remember uh, the Philistines just spanked the Israelites and stole the Ark of the Covenant. And um, there's a guy named Ichabod who was born. And uh, his name means the glory has departed. It was such a devastating loss to Israel because they prostituted God's glory in order to receive, you know, victory over their enemies, military advantage. You know, the thing they wanted to use God's glory for was something God wanted for them. Isn't that weird? Like God wanted them to have victory over the Philistines. He commanded them to go out and, and, and to conquer. And, but what do they do? They use his presence. All right. So they lose the Ark of the Covenant, but then... Uh, you guys remember what happens? The Ark of the Covenant sits in the temple of Dagon. And they, they turn the lights out, you know, and they go home. And the next morning, it's time for Dagon service or something. You know, do you think that at the Church of Dagon, they have like coffee and donuts? And... Yeah, you know. Come to Dagon service, you know, the Kiwanis are meeting afterwards. <laughs> Dagon school beforehand. <laughs> anyway, so they, <laughs> they go into the temple of Dagon, and what do they find? The statue of Dagon is on its face before the Ark of God. Amen. That's cool. So then they're like, ooh, something happened here. I, uh, somebody tipped over our God. <laughs> <laughs> Who tipped over the God, okay? <laughs> Got to put it back up, you know, bolt it down. Okay, now this time our God's definitely not going to fall down. Let's go home, you know, next day. They got to go back to Dagon school. 
And they go in and Dagon is on his face again before the ark of God. This happens a few times. The last time, do you remember what happened? Dagon is on his face and his hands were broken off. And then these tumors start appearing on all of the Philistine leaders, right? So the Philistines do what Philistines do and they make gold tumors and they put it in the <laughs> Ark of the Covenant uh, because they figure maybe that'll make God happy. They don't know God, you know, they've got Dagon. So like maybe that's the kind of stuff Dagon likes. And so they bring, uh, they, they say, okay, Israelites, you can have your Ark back. Uh, we've made a terrible mistake and you can have it back. So they put it on an ox cart and they just put it on these oxen and they just let the oxen go. Nobody's guiding the oxen. The oxen take it to the house of a guy named Obed-Edom, luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> so they were gonna take, they were gonna follow Israel, you know, under King David was going to follow the Philistines suit and they, they, they get the Ark of the Covenant, they put it on an ox cart because that's how the Philistines handled the glory. Um, they didn't put it on the shoulders of the Levites, which by the way, there's a sermon right in there, isn't there? God's glory was meant to be carried by his people, not on structures that are man-made, right? You can, you can noodle on that. Somebody else can preach that sermon. You know, if somebody else, though, if, if Art preaches that sermon from here, you guys got to remember that. I said it first, okay? <laughs> so, um, so then, as they're carrying um, the, the ark of God's presence on the ox cart, you guys remember what Uze did. The... The ox cart hits a pothole because they're probably in Michigan. <laughs> and, and the ox cart starts to tip and Uzza touches the ark to stabilize it. Zapped. He's dead. The dude is dead for doing something good. Whoa. And you might be thinking, God, what the heck? That's what David was thinking. David was furious. If you read the text, David is angry. He's like, God, how could you kill my cousin? All he did was try to stabilize the ark. Well, if they had listened to the Lord in the first place, they never would have been in this situation. If they had carried the glory in a holy way rather than a common way, so here's, the, here's the, the thing. In our Western mindset, under modernism, we have a reduced definition for what it is to be right and wrong. Our system of morality is, is sort of distilled down to guilty versus not guilty. You guys, it's, it's guilt versus innocence. That's the framework through which we see the world. That's our lens. And you may not have realized that that's your lens, but if you live in this nation, if you've grown up in the West, not even in this nation, it's just sort of a, a part of Western culture, you know? Most Western nations sort of see the world this way. Why do we think this way? I, I, I don't know to be honest with you. It's just a tradition of thinking. We think that right and wrong is, did you hurt anyone else? If it doesn't hurt anyone else and it makes you happy, it's good. You know, do what makes you happy as long as you're not hurting anybody. That's people's moral code today. Have you heard that before? This is the sermon that the world preaches to itself. Do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. But then you've got to ask the question, well, what's wrong with hurting other people? Why is that wrong? And you might think, well, it's obvious, but is it? I mean, if you're just a regular old, uh, you know, chemical reaction that just sort of spontaneously came into being, just like me, do you have any more 
moral value than a rock or a chair or a frog or a tree. And under some ways of uh, like new age, they would say, actually, no, you know, if it's alive, then it has value. And, and so they've reduced value to something that, that, is, that is living. So, but what is wrong with hurting somebody else? Well, that other person, according to the Christian worldview, was created in the image of a holy God. That person was created with a destiny and a plan and a design. And for you to harm that other person is for you to profane something that is holy. Okay. Well, then what about yourself? Victimless crimes. I can look at that porn, you know. Who's, re- who's it really hurting? Well, the answer is, for the same reason it is wrong for you to violate your neighbor, it is wrong for you to violate yourself. Yeah. Because you are holy. Yeah. Because you were created in the image of a holy God. But it goes even deeper than that for us Christians, because why? He has chosen us, our physical bodies, to be his temple. Now remember Uzzah, he's struck dead because God views things in, not just in terms of guilty versus innocent, he views things in terms of holy and common, unclean and clean. And remember the purpose of the priests, the sons of Zadok. Their job was to teach the people the difference between the holy and the common. And you remember that question that I posed to you earlier? Why is God protecting his people from holiness? Imagine a whole ton of Uzzahs who have just been made holy by coming into contact with holiness through the priestly garments. And then they begin to treat themselves out of ignorance as though they were common. And suddenly you've got a big problem. And I have to tell you, I think that is the very problem we have right now. We have a whole lot of people who have been made holy, but they don't understand the difference between things that are holy and things that are common. Here are the three things that have been made holy that God has chosen as dwelling places and that so often we treat with a casual contempt. Number one is your body. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6 say? Uh, We can turn there if you like. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do I have it in my notes or do I have to turn there somewhere else? Okay, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12. Um, Paul is arguing with an invisible uh, um, partner And he says, uh, as a quotation from his hypothetical interlocutor, let's just close in prayer. Uh, (laughs) As he said to, to to the hypothetical guy he's arguing with, he says this, all things are lawful for me. That's in quotations. And then Paul says this, but not all things are helpful. Then, uh, then he says, you might say, all things are lawful for me. But then he says, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And then Paul's rejoinder, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord uh, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? 
For as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Okay, I don't need to expound too much on that. I think Paul did a pretty great job. It's really hard to top Paul. But I'm going to explain a few things that he said. Shall I take a member of Christ and join it with a prostitute? Do you understand that he was talking about a very particular member of somebody's body right there? And he's saying that that is a member of Christ. Here's the thing that scares me about sexual immorality. It's not that it separates me from God. It's that it doesn't. That's what terrifies me. Because whatever you do with your body, you're doing with Jesus. What you do with your body, you're doing with Jesus. Then he says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. I need to call out a sin that so frequently, so frequently goes unaddressed because I just, just out of ignorance, I think, But if you've looked yourself in the mirror and said, you are so ugly, you have sinned against the holy temple of God that he has chosen. And maybe that sin came out of a low self-worth. Maybe that sin came out of, you know, trauma, abuse, or just low self-esteem. And, and there are all kinds of reasons. But what you say about your body, you're saying about the temple of the holy living God. And he chose you. He saw you as fit to live in. He chose you and said, this seems like a great resting place for my presence and my glory. And I am choosing to have my fullness dwell in this very body. And if you then look at that thing, that beautiful thing that was fashioned by God himself, chosen to bear his image, and and then began to ridicule and to speak evil of it, you're sinning against a holy God and you're touching the ark. Uh, It goes without saying that that applies to other people as well. That whatever you say about them, you are saying about the temple of the holy God. Yeah, but brother, you don't know what they did. I don't. It could have been really awful. It could have been terrible. But God has, if they are in Christ, God has chosen them to be a dwelling place of his presence and of his glory. And what you say about your brother or sister in Christ, regardless of what they have done, you are saying about God's temple. Which brings me to the second place that God has chosen as his dwelling place. So number one was what? Your body and your neighbor's body. But what is number two? Number two is your relationships. Your relationships. Which is why... 
Peter gives us a warning, you know, if you don't treat your wife right, your prayers, God's not going to listen to your prayers. Yeah. Why? Well, where do people go to pray? They go to the temple. Mm -hmm. And so if God has chosen your relationships to be the, his temple, and in those relationships, you are, vi you are violating those relationships, you are touching the ark. God has chosen your, your relationships. Let's read a couple passages. Um, first, uh, we'll go to Ephesians 2, 22. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You are being built together. We are being built together. There's a few things that I want to draw your attention to. One is we're in the middle of a process. We are being built together. Number two is that this is about community. We are being built together. By the way, this is a great way to meditate on scripture verses. You just begin to emphasize different words and, they, and suddenly you begin, things begin to take on a, a, a new color. So in him, listen to that, in him, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This verse here tells me that God has chosen our fellowship, our relationships one with, an, one with another to be his dwelling. What do you think that looks like? I actually, I, I just want you to take a minute and just meditate on that. Your relationships with the other people in this church is a location chosen by God to be his resting place. Is he comfortable? Does he like it? You know that one passage in Matthew 5? I, th I think we might read it later. Uh, let's, uh, let's not go there yet. Let's, I'm going to, let's, one more verse. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay. So this gives a little bit more flavor to this, to this idea. We are living stones, and when we are assembled together, we become a, 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 a uh, he switches metaphors right in the middle of his metaphor, <laughs> doesn't he? He's like, he goes, you are living stones, you're like a temple, and you're being put together to become a, well, hold on, a priesthood. Well, that's weird, but I think it actually describes things even more accurately than if you were to just stick with the one metaphor, doesn't it? Because when we come together, we, we become a house for God, but then we also, our fellowship becomes a representation of the whole community before God. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Um, uh, worth meditating on, but don't have time. Um, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. There's a verse that I have heard misquoted, or rather, not misquoted, I've heard it misquoted quite a bit. I've heard it misapplied almost every single time I've heard this verse brought up. I bet you're wondering what verse it is. Jesus wept. No, I'm just kidding. All right, we're, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. I'll be honest with you, it is my least favorite three chapters in the whole Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. And if you don't know why, you haven't read it very carefully. <laughs> you haven't read it very carefully. Um, because there's a whole lot of stuff in there that is beautiful teaching. 
until you have to apply it. <laughs> and then it sucks. <laughs> All right, we're going to read it. Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard, it, uh, heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that whoever, uh, anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. All right. Here's what I don't like about that. Um, I've been angry with a whole lot of brothers. Um, I've insulted a few from time to time. And <laughs> I'm not talking about art, though probably I have insulted art. Never intentionally. Well, I don't know about that. And then I have certainly called a few people fools. But they act so foolishly. <laughs> and apparently this is grounds for the hell of fire hmm but what if people be acting a fool Here is what Jesus says later. Um, let's, let's read the rest of it. Uh, we're going to skip down to verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, by the way, this word for tunic, um, uh, the Greek word, you might have a note in your Bible that says um, kaitan, this is the Greek word, kaitan. It's actually uh, where um, we get this uh, word for uh, uh, kaitan. <laughs> uh, it's the uh, exterior, um, uh, exterior of certain bugs and stuff. It's like the exoskeleton. Um, but in Greek, uh, according to the notes in my Bible, the kaitan was a long garment worn under the cloak next to the skin. So what, is, what are clothes that you wear next to the skin? We call them underwear, all right? Underwear. All right, somebody wants to sue you and take your underwear. <laughs> Let them have your cloak as well. I don't know if you're doing the math here. <laughs> but somebody is going home very cold. <laughs> And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise. By the way, it's his son. <laughs> That's just a wonderful thing that Jesus said right there. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not, uh, do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Well, here's why I hate this verse. This is great teaching until you have an enemy. And then everything inside of you wants to say, but Jesus, this guy's a jerk. You know what a, some of you, your uh, bless those who curse you, you know, pray for those who spitefully use you. 
You know what spitefully used means? Here's another word for it. Abuse. Abuse. Whoa. Got real quiet. And this is what Jesus tells us. Hmm. I think you might be starting to understand my problems with the Sermon on the Mount. Because suddenly, this is impossible. I cannot do this. I'm reading this. I've been reading this. Uh, I've, I've spent maybe two or three weeks, almost every night, just reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7, over and over and over and over, and saying, God, please help. Because I am so far from the standard. I fall so far short of the standard. And he just in case there was any confusion, right in the middle of the sermon, he's like, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And I read that and I say, oh God, <laughs> I can't do that. I have people that I want to lay hands on. <laughs> Repeatedly. <laughs> with great force. <laughs> but if somebody insults me, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to resist an evil person. If somebody slaps me on one cheek, what am I supposed to do? Hey, you missed one. Yeah. <sighs> Jesus, we need help. Your flesh does not want to obey God. You know what the Bible says about it in, in Romans 8? It says, your flesh cannot obey God. It's impossible for those who walk in the flesh to please the Lord. Yes. How can we even do this? <laughs> Much less, have you watched the news lately? <laughs> I have to be honest with you. I have been enraged watching what has happened in Israel. It's wrong. It's wrong. And it's not wrong to call it wrong. No, wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, is, it is wrong, however, to look at an enemy and not love them. And do you see what I mean when love your enemies is, is all like great news until you actually have one? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you and persecute you. Ah. So... What if somebody lies about you and spreads a rumor? This has happened very recently to people who are very close to me. Actually, m many people who are very close to me seem to be walking through a real lying season right now. A lot of people lying on them. And, and to those people, what is the command of our Lord? Pray for them. Love them. Love them. And then what? You will be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And suddenly I see the ray of hope that I'm not supposed to try to do this in my old nature, but rather out of sonship, Amen. just taken after my daddy. My daddy sends, lets his sun shine on really wicked, horrible people. And he sends rain on people who hate him. And he sends his son to die for the people 
who were crucifying him. And it is only when I look at him, it is only when I behold his beauty and his glory and his presence and his splendor and his majesty, and I behold the Lord in his glory, and I am transformed into his image, and suddenly I can be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Because I'm not doing it in my own strength, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to transform me into someone who loves his enemies. That's the test of whether you've truly been born again, is if you are somebody who can actually love your enemies, there is something that's been made new on the inside of you. There's a new life that you're walking out. Now, I'm going to give a caveat because I know that many of you are asking, but what if I was abused? Should I just go back into that relationship? No, don't be dumb, okay? Like, it's okay to be safe and, and extricate yourself from dangerous situations, obviously. You should do that. You should do that. But, and does it mean that I have to trust that person to not sin again? No. Uh, you know, like, I think it's probable that they're going to sin again. And now you start to see why Peter would have to ask this question. Hey, uh, I was just doing the math, Lord, and I remember that thing you said about forgiveness. Um, how many times do I have to do that? <laughs> because what if somebody's really bad and like sins against me like seven times? And, it, and what, you guys remember Jesus' response? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Some, some manuscripts say 77 times. I like that part better because maybe it just gives me a little bit of wiggle room. <laughs> 77 times, it's still a lot of times. <laughs> it's still a lot of times. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, you just need to be perfect like God is. Yeah. Duh. Oh, it's just it's that simple. Just got to be like God. Okay. But do you remember what we were talking about before? Probably not. We were talking about holiness. So yeah, we're going to get to the sweat. Who said that? Yeah. We're going to get to the sweat. Don't sweat it. Yes. So, um, the reason I'm harping on this right now is because I think that God may be protecting us from holiness. Because if you, if you are not the kind of person that can love your enemy, you can't be trusted with the ark. When God increases the glory, the stakes get raised. Ananias and Sapphira, what was their crime? Uh, you're thinking of Hophni and Phineas. They lied to who? The Holy Spirit. To Peter? No. I have a theory about what was going on there, but uh, that's going to open a whole other can of worms. Don't talk about it, John Mark. Um, when someone is prophesying, there is some, uh, they would use this term, that person was in the Spirit. I think that there was a spirit of prophecy that came over Peter in that moment. This is my theory. This is John Mark's theory. Um, and when they lied to Peter as he was in the spirit, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. They didn't get struck dead for lying to Peter. When the glory and the level of manifestation of God's power and his presence is increased, so are the stakes. You, if you, if you lie about something trivial to me, you're not going to get in that much trouble. If 
you do it to the FBI, suddenly you can go to jail. And when you increase the authority to the person against whom you are transgressing, you increase the stakes. And, may, and suddenly you start to wonder why maybe God might be protecting us from holiness. Because if you are not the kind of person that can love somebody who's lying about you, if you're not the kind of person who can have, have genuine grace and mercy and forgiveness and not say something that would profane the temple of the Holy Spirit, can you be trusted with something that is so holy? I think so often we are crying out, God, show us your glory. Let your glory fall in this room. Come, Lord. And I pray those prayers constantly. But if you are unprepared, you are asking for judgment. <laughs> You're saying, come, O ark of God. We have a great ox cart for you to hang out in. We need to distinguish between the holy and the common. You remember when uh, uh, in scripture, I believe it's in Ephesians, it says that, you know, put away all foolish talk and coarse jesting which are out of place. Yeah. Well, what's, it's out of place for a mouth that is dedicated to holy worship. To engage in, in, in profanity. I have a friend who, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, was in the middle of an argument. And the Holy Spirit came upon, there, in an argument, there were a couple, and they were arguing about a couple things, you know. And the Spirit of God came upon my friend. And suddenly, in the Spirit, she goes, Holy, 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 I am holy, I am holy. That put a stop to that argument right there. I'm going to talk about the sweat for a moment. And then I'm going to talk about the third place where that is God's temple. What's the first? Body. Second? Relationship. Okay, we're going to save the third for a moment. Let's talk about the sweat. I'll say this, the holy place of his glory is no place for striving in the flesh. Yep. We can only operate in the holy place of God's presence by grace. Yep. As soon as we try to force it in our own strength, by our own self-effort, by our own selfish ambition, and trying to get the things that we want out of God, instead of coming with fear and trembling into the holy place of God's presence, and say, God, this is your house, this is your house, this is your house. I ask before I look in the fridge. <laughs> It is not a place for us to strive. It's a place for rest. What does Hebrews say? Strive to enter the place of his rest. I'm going to read it, actually. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, talking about the people under the old covenant. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith uh, with those who listened. For 
We who have believed enter that rest as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has uh, pass through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Thank the Lord. But one who is in every respect, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mm, isn't it just good to let the scriptures just wash over your soul? Okay, why did the people fail to enter the rest? It, there were two things, and if you were listening or reading very carefully, you may have caught that the two things that prevented those under the old covenant from entering rest was unbelief and disobedience. Unbelief and disobedience. Obedience brings rest. Yeah. Obedience brings rest. Mm -hmm. But I'm so burnt out serving God. Maybe you're serving God in disobedience. Yeah. Well, what the heck does that mean? It means that maybe you're doing things well enough, but they're not obedience. What are the two things necessary for something to be obedience? You must act, but, some, but before that, what has to happen? There has to be a command. That means that your action has to be prompted by God. And some of us are not waiting for him to speak and instead just step out. And what did I say to you earlier? The holy place of God's presence is no place for sweat. Our work must be initiated by the Spirit, dependent upon Him. Well, can't I have dreams? Absolutely, dream. And, 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 but as long, if you're dreaming apart from God, we call that selfish ambition. If you're dreaming, says, Holy Spirit, what if we did this? I think He likes that. I think He likes that a lot. As soon as you start to view his presence as a means then for you to get what you want out of your ministry, you start to do the thing that I was talking about earlier with the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. And so everything then must be done in faith, trusting that when he tells you to do impossible things that they suddenly become possible. You must be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And then we must obey. Okay, so that's, that was the sweat thing, Megan. Are you happy? Yes. Okay. I clearly got my All right, here's the last thing. The, uh, well, it's, it's the almost last thing, all right? The last thing is this. 
Body, relationships. The last one is this. I hope that you're paying attention because I'm only going to say it once. Just kidding. I'll say it as many times as you want. <laughs> the last thing is this. Gathering. Gathering. But isn't that the same as relationships? No. No. You can gather with people and not be in relationship with them. Have you ever been to a Tigers game? <laughs> you can gather with people without being in relationship. And I have a, a fear that many churches are gatherings without relationships. And they have one expression of the temple, but they don't have the full expression, which is, by the way, why we do house church. Because in house church, you can have the relationship and the gathering together. Yeah. Yeah. And you can enjoy the fullness of God's presence within that context. Yeah. But let me talk about gathering. This is why I was tempted to wear a suit. How would you worship if you took Jesus at his word, when he said this, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. What would your praise be like? What would you ask of God? I have often said this, many of you have heard me say it, but I'm going to say that again, and it will not be the last time. Some of you may feel like you are struggling with spiritual laziness or complacency, apathy. You may feel like if I could just be more disciplined about prayer, I would be a better Christian. And I have to tell you, you have prayer completely wrong. Yeah. You have prayer completely wrong. Prayer is not something you do to earn God's pleasure over you. Prayer is something you do because God is pleased to be with you. Prayer is a privilege, not a duty. It is a privilege, not a duty. It is not your spiritual chores. You don't pray so that God can give you the attaboy. Good job. What does, what does prayer do for God? Nothing. He does not need you to pray. What do we do when we're praying? We're enjoying the thing he purchased at such a costly price. It cost him the blood of his son to bring you into relationship with himself. And in prayer, you appropriate the things that God has already won for you. In prayer, we enjoy and celebrate the things that God has already won for you. So what are you getting out of prayer? You are enjoying the one who enjoys you. What, are, what does God get out of prayer? He doesn't get anything that he's lacking. It, the only thing that he gets out of prayer is he gets to enjoy your presence. He gets to enjoy you. And it was evidently so costly for him. It was so important to him that he paid Calvary for it. So, in our prayer, in our prayer, I think that if you, were, if you were absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced that Jesus was on the other side of the door of your prayer closet, in the flesh, waiting for you to come and talk to him, I don't know if you've ever tried to get appointments with very important people, but they don't usually wait for you. You're usually in the waiting room trying to get to the doctor. But in prayer, you have the doctor in the waiting room waiting for you to come to see him. And if you were convinced that he was there, every single one of you, you wouldn't be here. You'd be there. And suddenly, I think you realize now, hopefully you do, you don't have a laziness problem. You have an unbelief problem. 
You have an unbelief problem. You want to grow in your discipline of prayer, grow in your belief. And you step into the place of prayer, knowing, here I am, Lord. I know you've been waiting for me. Come and take delight in me, and I will come and delight myself in your goodness, in your presence, in your glory, in your majesty, in your love, your mercy, in your goodness. And I will delight in the name of the Lord every day of my life because every breath is a gift from him. And I just begin, I'm just like, I'm, you just got a little glimpse into my prayer life, all right? And so this is what it's like when I pray. Sometimes I don't feel like praying. I, I'm just like you, and I get grumpy from time to time. And I don't feel like praying sometimes. So what do I do? I go into the prayer closet anyway. <laughs> and I say, I begin to preach the gospel to my own soul. And I say, John Mark, you were bought at a price and you are not your own. The blood of the most precious one of heaven was shed for you to make you holy and blameless without a single fault. And suddenly I start to get a little skip in my step and I start, start to think he's chosen your body as a dwelling place of his very spirit. And your very hands are holy because they have been anointed by the Holy One. And I just begin to think about how, oh man, well that makes sense why the people at Subway get healed when I'm just getting a sandwich. And and, you know, like I, I just start to get happy, enjoying the gospel. And that is what prayer is all about. It is enjoying the gospel. Enjoy the gospel. Enjoy the gospel. Okay. I was going to say one thing I, I've left undone before we wrap things up. Um, earlier, I mentioned the verse that everyone gets wrong. I always used to think that this verse, if we always quote it, if your brother has something against you, uh, what we think it says is, if you have something against your brother, that's not what it says. You, you remember the passage I'm talking about in Matthew 5, leave your gift at the altar, go be reconciled with your brother, then come back, okay? Then it has this whole thing about like the judge and like being handed over to the accusers and it's like, ooh, scary stuff, another sermon. But if uh, you remember Jason's sermon, Last Encounter Night, he said he was praying for healing for his son, but, at, but he, Jason's very visionary in his prayer. I'm not that much. I'm more emotional. I, I, I feel and, and I think when I'm praying. Jason sees, you know, the, that's his primary way of communicating in the spirit. And, and so when, when uh, Jason was praying, he saw the gates shut before him. He was about to enter the holy place of God's presence and enjoy the union and, and, uh, with the Father and, and make requests in order to pray for his son and various things. But the angels closed the door in a vision and said, you uh, are not welcome here right now because of something that you said to your coworker. Go and apologize. And do you guys remember what happened after he apologized? He called his friend. His friend was super gracious to him. And then he prayed. And then he heard screams from his wife. The skin condition that his son Josiah was suffering from left in that instant. Left that instant. Do you think that God might be serious about relationships? so much that he would shut up heaven, not listen to your prayers until you have been reconciled. Why? Because it is for your own sake that you may profane something that is holy. 
treat something that is holy as though it is common. Here's my charge to you. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to repeat a prayer with me. Thank you, Lord, for choosing my body to be a dwelling place of your spirit. I am your temple. Make me clean and holy, devoted to you. Make me a place where others will encounter you. I want you to open your eyes and look around you. Your relationships with these people, everyone that you can see, was chosen by a holy God to be his dwelling place. And when things are right here, things are right here. And I want you to look at where we are right now. This is a place that has been dedicated as a meeting place where God's people come. And every time we assemble here and at your house church, every time two or more gather in his name, it becomes holy. It becomes holy. But what if we're not talking about holy things? Now, this. I have often, I, I, I have for a while been thinking about the idea, and this is a Pentecostal church, we believe in the altar call. We believe in the laying on of hands. It's scriptural. It's scriptural. And Art, if, if you would uh, um, jump on the keys for me and Josh. Yeah, is any, does anybody not have co communion elements? Swanee. I would like the privilege of serving you communion. Anybody else? Um, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians where he says that many of you are weak and sick because you are partaking and participating of the Lord's body and his blood in an unworthy manner. You're treating something that is holy as though it is common. I want you, what is it to take this in an unworthy manner? In the, in the context, it lays out a few things. One, there was disregard between brothers. There was the, the rich people came first, and because they brought all the food, they thought that they were entitled to eat and drink before everybody else got there. And then the poor people showed up, and there was nothing to eat. And suddenly there was, there was disharmony, disfellowship. And... The other thing is, I think that we don't recognize what a privilege it is. We, 
reduce the bread and the cup to mere tokens. I want you to raise your, the elevation, uh, I want you to elevate your estimation of, of this right here. This is his body. It was broken for you. It's his blood that was shed for you. Here's what I would like. Maybe there are some of you who things are not right between you and a brother or a sister, and you know it. I'm not talking about, I think maybe, you know, like you've, you've got question marks. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about those who may have question marks. I'm talking about those who you, you know, you know, things aren't right. I'm not gonna give you permission to have false guilt and, and all those types of things. But if things are not right between you and a brother or a sister, there's sin in your life and you know that it needs to be dealt with before you partake of something holy, I want you to do two things. I want you to hold on to your communion elements. I want you to hold on to them. I want you to take them with you. And when you have repented and confessed your sin, I want you to take that bread and I want you to drink the, the, the blood. And I want you to imbibe the forgiveness and the cleansing of the Lord Jesus. Maybe you've profaned your body. Maybe you have uh, profaned this gathering. I don't know. But if there is something within you that you know that you need to repent, I want you to take a moment and I want you to just ask for the grace and the mercy of the Lord. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus, but you want to. You're far from God or you feel that way. I want you to I want you to take this moment and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. If you're here and you haven't been you haven't been saved, you haven't been born again, you haven't been made a child of the Father, you haven't been made new by the Spirit, but you want to be. You want to. Would you just raise a hand? Because I believe that God is going to do a miracle in you. Is there anybody who's in that place where you don't know you don't know him, but you want to. You're far from God, but you want to be close. Would you just raise a hand? I'm not going to make you come up to the front. I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm not going to embarrass you to the best of my ability. But I'm going to invite you to become filled with him. Is there anybody like that right now? trust that we're all children of the King. So if you have a clear conscience, with fear and trembling, I want you to hold this thing that 
is his body. And I want us to give thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is your body broken for us. We remember your sacrifice, oh Jesus. And we participate in the gospel. We participate in the gospel, the broken body, the broken body, so that we can be whole. Let's partake of the body and give thanks together. This cup is a cup of the new covenant which is in his blood and it was spilled for you this is the gospel God bled and died so you can live <laughs> we rejoice we rejoice and we give thanks. I want you to be mindful of this as well. This was blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of your sins and the forgiveness of the one who has sinned against you. And when we partake of this cup, we do not partake of this as individuals but we partake of this as one body sharing in one cup, one cup, one cup. If I am a part of Jesus and you are a part of Jesus, then we are a part of one another. And if and as much as we are united with Christ, we are united with one another. And in this cup, Jesus said, may they be one. As Father, you and I are one. <laughs> That's a kind of unity that blows my mind. in your soul, if there is brokenness on the inward parts of you, this is the blood that was shed to make you whole. This is the blood that was shed to make you whole. This is the blood that was shed to make you whole. So in faith, in faith, we're not drinking juice out of a plastic cup. By faith, we are drinking his very blood. And let us partake together and give thanks.